I want you to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. I'd like to give a nativity sermon. Genesis, chapter 3. The Bible begins with a conversation between a woman, a married woman, and an angel, if you think about it. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. But the Bible goes on to explain that when he says the serpent, he's talking about the devil. The serpent of old, the devil. Subtle. What's he want to do? Well, he wants to he wants to estrange the woman and her husband from God. That's what he wants to do, and that's what the devil wants to do this day: estrange you from God, get you away from God. Don't let God be part of your life. That's what the serpent's doing today, and that's what the serpent was doing from the beginning. He does it by his subtlety. He said to the woman, hey, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Oh, he puts God in a bad light. He asks a loaded question. It's so loaded. He knows it's not true. She knows it's not true. It's an exaggeration of the strictness of God. That's one of the ways the serpent does it. But the woman tries to correct him. The woman said to the serpent, no, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. God didn't say we can't eat of all the trees. We can eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the one tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it. So far, so good. But then she said, nor shall you touch it. A slight exaggeration of how strict God is. He makes it out that God's stricter than he really is. Then she said, lest you die. Well, that is a slight minimization, a subtle minimization of the penalty. For God didn't say you might die. He said, if you eat that tree, you will die. But the serpent said, the woman said, we might die. And that's when the serpent knew that to the woman he could openly deny the word of God. Verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not die. You shall not surely die. Oh, that's, we got that around to this day. That's, that's reincarnation, that's uh, ghosts and all that stuff, vampires and all that kind of occult mythology, seances, you don't really die. You do die. <laughs> if you, the wages of sin is death. You're going to die, and then when you die, you're stuck where you died, either with God or away from God forever. But you do die. The serpent says, no, you won't, you won't die. And then he goes on to say, uh, you, God knows that the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open. That's, that's an old one, isn't it? If you just do this sin, you will really mature. Your eyes will be open. You will see a realm you never saw. That's how I got started smoking pot many years ago. Man, you want your eyes open? You want to broaden your horizons? My brain got so open it almost fell out of my head. Your eyes will be open. Well, no one wants to be considered stupid, simple, naive. He said, and then you will be as gods. This is the first sin. You should be as gods. In other words, you don't need to worship a god. And you don't need to be under a god. You could be your own God. And he goes on to explain what it means. What does it mean to be his gods? Knowing good and evil? 
No. You should be as God's deciding for yourself what good and evil is. You don't need God to tell you. You just make up your own mind. That's the serpent. Okay, now look, do you believe that? That's going to set you on a course of life. I'm speaking to the young people. A whole course of life. Go right down that road. Looks really shiny at first. You want your mouth full of gravel? You want emptiness? You want hatred? You want despair? You want sorrow? Just go down that road and believe the serpent. Be your own God. Decide for yourself what's right and wrong and go for it. That's the serpent's lie. And the end of it is hell, of course. He says, you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. Verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, see, she's already doing it. She's already deciding for herself what good and evil are. Not going to let that church tell me what good and evil is. Not going to let old Pastor Bill tell me what's right and wrong. Not going to let the Bible, a dusty old ancient book. No way. I decide for myself. And that's how we fell. That's how every, all the misery in the world came because a whole race of people believed the serpent's lie and fell and became estranged from God. And that's how the Bible opens with a conversation between an angel and a woman. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it also to her husband with her and he did eat. Well, there he is standing there. <laughs> Idly. <laughs> Someone says, the woman made men fell. No, that she didn't. The man's held responsible. She had the conversation with the fallen angel. Because that's what Satan is, is a fallen angel. But he sat there idly. Oh, I let my wife do the religious thing, you know. He just let it happen. When he was called to be the leader. Of course, that's another thing that they've thrown out because it came from God. And you get, when you're your own God, you can decide whatever order you want. She gave the fruit to her husband. They both ate it. Verse 7, the eyes of them both were open. Oh, you do get your eyes open after all, right? Yes. Now they know good and evil by experience. So I guess the serpent was half right. Your eyes will be open. Man, do I ever know some things by experience I wish I never knew? Have I ever come into the understanding of things that I wish I didn't even understand at all? There's two ways to know anything, especially anything spiritual. You could take God's word for it, or you could find out for yourself. There's a beautiful song that Keith Green used to sing. Some people won't find out till it's too late. Someone has to pay the price for your sins. You can pay it yourself or let someone else. But who would be that nice? And he goes on to say, I know someone that is. He's your best friend. He really is. <laughs> His name is Jesus. <laughs> anyway, back to the conversation. See, they both eat. Their eyes are open now, and they know that they're naked. You become incredibly self-conscious. And they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. And then they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Judgment day is coming. The Lord's coming. It's, it's, it's forecast right here in, in the first part of the Bible. When the Lord comes, no matter how ready you are, you're going to be summoned out of your hiding place and called up before the bar. They're terrified. The man, the woman, and yes, the fallen angel called up before the throne of justice. And he says to the man, who told you you were naked? Now, why would God have to ask questions 
of mortal men when he already knows everything? Well, there could only be one reason. He actually wants to get us to humbly confess to him. But the man refused accountability. So the Lord moved on to the woman. What happened to you? Well, the serpent made me do it. Oh, the woman refused accountability. So he just moved on to the fallen angel. But this one he didn't ask any questions of. How many of you know you better be glad that God asks questions of us? What's he doing? He's giving us a chance to confess. You only got one life to finally get to this point where you confess. I don't care how painful it is. It's the most important day in your life. The day you go before the real God and say, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. But neither one would do it at that point. So he just moves on to the fallen angel. But he asks him no question. Why? Because he doesn't intend to save him. God's willing to save us, sons of Adam, but not fallen angels. Instead, he pronounces a judgment on him, which amounts to a shaft of light penetrating the gloom in the courthouse in Genesis 3. For he says to the serpent in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go. Dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Here, and here's, the, here's the gloom of light. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy in the Bible. It's the first gospel in the Bible. That's why it's called the Proto-Evangel, the first gospel. And the man and woman, though fallen, were still far more sophisticated than we are. This is the original man and woman. They could understand, basically, that what he's saying is, I'm going to send a savior not through the man, but the woman, the seed of the woman. Think about it. Women don't have seed. Women have eggs. Then what do you mean the seed of the woman? A virgin born savior is going to come into the world. And when he says he will crush the serpent's head, they were sophisticated to understand that he was saying he will reverse everything the serpent did to the human race. He will reverse the fortunes of the fallen, damned human race. He will bring a salvation to whoever will, and he will undo the work of the devil and even destroy the work of the devil, but not without pain. For the original prophecy said, but the devil will bruise his heel. You ever bruise your heel? Something very painful about bruising your heel and it doesn't, pain don't go away quickly. He shall crush your head. You shall bruise his heel. And he said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. And this is another thing I want to comment about. See, this prophecy has a double meaning. It's got a very, very singular meaning. The seed of the woman is a specific person who's going to come into the world virgin born and the rest of the bible just elaborates on the prophecies what's he going to be like well he'll be born in bethlehem he'd be like moses well they tried to kill moses when he's a baby they tried to kill him when he's a baby and he will he will be exalted but he will be crucified i mean the, the prophecies of the bible just paint the picture by the time they're done you you can't deny who that is jesus christ is the seed of the woman and then who's the seed of the serpent? Well, there's a person coming. I don't think he's arrived on the scene yet. Who is in total affinity with Satan. He'll be a world ruler. He will deceive most of the world. And they will accept him and not Jesus. And they will be damned for it. But there's another level of meaning to this prophecy. And that is a corporate meaning. What this prophecy predicts is the separation of the whole human race into two kinds of people 
the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now, the devil can't have physical children, so that's not what this is saying. It speaks more of moral and spiritual affinity with the devil. A lot of people don't realize that they are in moral affinity with the devil. They don't realize that. What do do I mean? Who then are the seed of the serpent? There are those that manifest that spirit of independent pride by which their father, the devil, fell. There are all those who won't acknowledge their own hopeless condition and submit to be saved by the merits of the Son of God. But either they themselves will uh, attempt to save themselves, if they even think they need it, or deny the necessity of anything at all. And they will clamor against God if they have any belief in his existence because he doesn't at once gratify their wishes without any reference to his broken law. But they're they're blinded and maddened by self-conceit. They actually believe the lie of the serpent and consider themselves as God. Therefore, they have no reverence for the one true God, nor do they hesitate to defy his will if their own inclinations lean that way. Such are the serpent's seed distinguished by the spirit which animates their father and federal head and doomed in the last to share with him in the lake of fire. All human race be divided. Then who are the seed of the woman? Well, the rest of the story explains it. Remember they made fig leaves to cover their shame. (laughs) Now they knew evil by experience. (laughs) How I wish I would have taken God's word for it. But now I know it firsthand. And they fashioned these fig leaves to cover their sin. And that's what human beings have been doing ever since. That is human psychology. One kind of fig leaf after another to cover your own shame. But what the Lord God did, and the man and the woman did allow him to do, is he stripped them of their fig leaves. And he fashioned for them clothing made out of the skin of an animal that he killed. Bloody clothing. And he put it on them. And they allowed him. See, who's the seed of the woman? All those who humbly acknowledge that sin demands death and they put their reliance of the guilty on the sacrifice appointed by God himself and all those who endure persecution for the sake of the eternal goal and the expectation they expect the triumph of God through the seed of the woman and they're willing to be stripped of their own righteousness and saved by the blood of the Lamb. I remember when I first came into the Christian church, I thought, man, is this ever bloody? We say, we are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. This is my body, this is my blood. This is bloody. But what was God teaching me? There's something so wrong with you. But the only way you could ever be saved and made acceptable to God is if someone died for you in your place. That's what he's teaching. Well, this is how the Bible begins. Conversation between a woman and an angel. Now go to Luke chapter 1. Centuries later, another woman is visited by another angel. Only this one's not fallen. I used to go to church where they worshipped Mary. Now that's a sin. You can't worship a person. It's a deep, deep sin. It's called idolatry. 
And we had statues of Mary. We did veneration, lit candles, bowed down. The very thing the Bible says, you should not bow down and worship an idol. We would genuflect. We had a picture, or a statue in the front of St. Ludmilla's church of Mary standing on the globe. And when you looked under her feet, there was the serpent. And we marveled until I came to realize many years later, that's a blasphemous perversion of the first gospel. The seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. Not the woman. <laughs> what is that? Well, that's the devil himself trying to displace. You're supposed to worship Christ, not Mary. Christ alone. But having said that, I got to say I love Mary. As a biblical figure, I love her. And I see something so special about her. Because what I see in her is the antidote to Eve. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin and spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. She's engaged. <laughs> we don't know what her age was or anything. It doesn't matter. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women. I used to say a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That was our prayer. You'd say 10 of those for every Our Father and a rosary. The first part of it's totally biblical. Just saying what the angel said. The second part is totally idolatrous. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and at the hour of our death. If you're going to put your faith in another fallen human being at the hour of your death, you are going to wake up in the lake of fire because no human being can save you. Only Jesus can. But having said that, look what the angel said. You are highly favored. Blessed are you among women. <laughs> he says, you will be blessed among women. There's a story in the Old Testament of a real serpent of a man who had been t terrorizing the children of Israel with an army. And this went on for a long time, and then they had a judge named uh, Deborah. And Deborah prophesied over a, a general, take this army, the Lord will give you victory. I mean, it was so lopsided. This, this, this evil army had like 900 metal iron chariots. The Israelites didn't even have a horse. <laughs> he said, no, the Lord will give you the victory. He says, I won't do it unless you go with us. So she went with him. And one part of the battle, I mean, the Lord did give them victory because what happened is they lured the, the enemy chariots into a field and the Lord sent such a rain that the chariots got bogged down. And the enemy's just ditching off the chariots right and left. The children of Israel are chasing them down. The people used to terrorize them, killing them. But the general got away. And he slipped into the tent of a woman who wasn't Jewish. But she was sympathetic to the God of Israel. He didn't know that. So he went into her tent in the Middle East for a man to go into a woman's tent. That's already a violation. The modesty is so, so extreme. And she said, come here and put your, he said, you got any water? She said, I got something better, warm milk. She said, come here, put your head on my lap. I'll feed you warm milk. Well, it sounds sensual. It sounds evil. It's in the Bible. What's warm milk make you do? Especially if you're exhausted, it makes you sleep. So then she took a tent peg and a hammer and she drove the tent peg into his temple <laughs> the 
seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. And you know what Deborah the prophetess said to her? Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. How many know that story's not going to make it into a Christmas card? (laughs) What is it? A foretaste of the seed of the woman crushing the serpent's head. Blessed are you, Jael, among all women. Really? What Mary's going to do is even greater. She said, Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she, will, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this could be. What is this greeting? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Seed of the woman. She's a virgin. Seven centuries before, the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a child. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Same prophet said, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government of the whole earth shall be upon his shoulders. And his contemporary Micah said, As for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are least among the towns of Judah, out of you shall he come, whose going forth is of old. Eternal God becomes a man, goes into a virgin's womb. Could this be a peasant girl in in, uh, backwater Israel? You call his name Jesus and he'll be great. And he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David. You know, over the, over the centuries, the symbol for Christianity was a cross, which is all right. It's kind of offensive to some. When you think about it, it'd be like if you had a modern religion, the, the symbol was the electric chair or something, right? But it could just as easily be a baby. Remember, things, remember what he said in the garden? Salvation is going to come through a baby. A baby. Think of how Satan hates babies. And how he has persuaded people in this modern age to kill babies in the millions. Or made people think, don't even have babies. Or promoted forms of sexuality that are perverted and can't produce babies. That's Satan. Homosexuality is of Satan. So is abortion. They're twins. They're two twins. They're deformed twins. That's Satan working. Salvation's going to come through a baby, they said in the garden. Now he says to this virgin, you are going to have a child. She says, uh, verse 34, she then said, Mary to the angel, How shall this be? See, it's another angel, another woman, another conversation. How can I have a child? I had never known a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. See, Christmas is a big deal. Nativity is a huge, huge deal. Doesn't matter to me what time of year it is. I think about these things year round. But think of the magnitude. This goes all the way back to the garden where the couple are sitting there in their gloom, in their damnation. (laughs) And a shaft of light comes. A virgin shall have a child crush the serpent's head, but he'll bruise his heel. And now centuries, centuries, centuries later, a little virgin, 
How could this be? I don't know a man. The Holy Ghost will come on you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. And that holy thing that should be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? He gives her a sign. Behold thy cousin Elizabeth. She also has conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month with her who was called barren. They didn't have facts. They didn't have Facebooks. They didn't have telephones. And her, her cousin's away, way over somewhere else. He says, no, she's, already, she's been barren all her life. Now she's six months pregnant. Mary went and checked it out. She had to go on a journey to check it out. There's no other way you know. Guess what? As soon as she came in the presence of her cousin... The first person to praise Jesus was an unborn child. He leapt for joy in her womb and recognized. And then she began to prophesy. For with God, look at verse 37 and believe. Oh, if I could get you to believe. How I long for you to believe. With God, nothing's impossible. Or what it literally says, with God, no word is void of power. And Mary said, now see, this is where everything, just like in Genesis, everything's hinged on that woman thinking about what the fallen angel told her and looking at the fruit and deciding for herself. And there's so much in that moment, right? But here's a counter moment where Mary's thinking about what this angel told her. And then she says these beautiful words. Behold, verse 38, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Wow. The one said to God, not your will, mine the other said not my will yours you know what it took for her to say that yes you know what they're going to think about her an engaged woman to a pious zedak is what they call him a righteous one joseph and she's pregnant now you know the pain and possibly death they could bring on her, the reproach. There's something called the reproach of Christ. Some people won't accept Jesus Christ because they're afraid of the reproach. They don't want it. They somehow instinctively know there is a reproach with Christ. This world does not love Christ. This world does not worship Christ. This world hates Christ, really. And this is what keeps many people. Mary wasn't ashamed, even to be called, she was called a harlot. She got pregnant out of wedlock. Back in those days, I mean, once you made an engagement, that was a marriage in a sense. To break it is adultery. Adultery, the penalty for adultery is death by stoning. All this is going, I know all this is going through her mind as she talks to this angel. And yet she says, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. She said yes to God. And then it goes on to say how she, how she uh, found out that her cousin really was pregnant, even though she was past childbearing age. Six months pregnant, just what the angel said. And verse 46, and Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord. You know what that literally says? My soul is focused on the Lord. That's what I pray for everyone here, especially in this holiday, that we would keep the feast in faith and focus on the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Well, another one of the blasphemous teachings of the Catholic Church is that Mary was completely without sin. You know the church downtown, Immaculate Conception? People think that's talking about the way Jesus was born. No, it's not. It's talking about Mary. Catholic Church has a false doctrine that says Mary herself was conceived without sin. Well, how was she conceived without sin? Does that mean her parents without sin? Does that mean their parents without sin? What are you talking about? This is the devil 
taking away from the uniqueness of Christ. But listen to Mary right here. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She needed a Savior because she was a sinner too. For he had regarded, verse 48, the lowest state of his handmaiden. You kidding? He regarded the low, low state of the human race and did something about it. From here on, all generations will call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. His mercy is on those that fear him. From generation to generation, he showed strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He put down the mighty from their seats. He exalted those of low degree. He filled the hungry with good things. But the rich he shall send empty away. If you think you're full and don't need God... You get nothing. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You get everything. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. That was a prophecy. I just want to close by saying this. This is a great time to be saved. This is a great time to give your life to Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are. God brought you here today to hear this message. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. I want to give you a chance to step forward out of your seat. Come up to this altar and let us pray for you to accept Jesus Christ, to let him come into your heart. You know how in the Christmas story, they said there's no room. Like they were singing about it, no room in the inn. Well, is there room in your inn? For Jesus? Someone says, well, my heart's not too clean. Well, Jesus was born in the stable. He'll come in and scoop the manure out. He'll come in and make you holy. Is there anybody here right now who would like to come forward? Don't be ashamed and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is the most important thing that you could ever do in your life. And you don't know if you'll ever have another chance to do it. The best thing I ever did when I was 18 or 19 years old is just put aside my pride, got up on my feet, and went forward and asked Jesus to come into my heart. They're going to do a song. When that song's over, this service is over. But I want to give you a chance right now. Come forward.